In the 90s, Playmates Toys made the deepest line of Star Trek action figures in history. My name's Keith, and I'm a collector working towards owning all 284. I've been a Trek fan for almost 35 years, and most people are sick of me talking about it. But somehow I've convinced my old friend Mike to review them with me on... Look at my Star Trek toys! Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to Look at my Star Trek toys! Oh boy, we've been having fun playing with Playmates 4.5-inch action figures from the Star Trek line from the 90s. Uh, very excited about this week. We have ne the Next Generation Recurring Friends and Enemies Part 1. How's it going, Mike? I'm excited, Keith. Last week I was able to get you to do some role play with the figures. Uh, who knows? This week we might uh, do a deep Pass. fake and really just get your face on a figure, which I know is actually probably your dream come true. Uh, good luck with that. I, you know, I have one. I have an action figure of my wife. I know you do, Keith, but your wife uh, is not you, and uh, so <laughs> you know what? Maybe if uh, we can get enough subscribers, we'll uh, we'll pool our resources and we'll get you a Keith Varney. Now, Keith, it, if we were to make a figure of you, mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. what crew would you like to join? Ooh, that is a very good question. Okay, well, from well, from a from a <laughs> from a storytelling perspective. It would be super exciting to be on Deep Space Nine or Voyager, but for me, I like the uh, I like the comforts, I like the comforts of life. I like to more of more of a leisurely pace. So I definitely want to be on uh, Next Gen. I want to be on the Enterprise D. That ship was giant. It was pretty much like a uh, like a hotel. It's like a Holiday Inn in the '90s. There was, you know, if you actually looked at the scale of the ship. It was designed to be able to like transport ten thousand people in an, in uh, an emergency, but it had a complement of about two thousand. So I think somebody did a, a YouTube video I watched, and there was like two thousand, three thousand square feet per person on the ship. Oh wow! So uh, yeah, so you could you could live pretty comfortably on there. And you does had, uh, everyone have access to the holodeck, or is that just for crew and like specific? I tell you what, that has always been a question of mine because I. Uh, would believe that holodeck time would be pretty difficult to get your hands on. Be even if you had like seven or eight of them, uh, I imagine they would be booked 24-7 pretty hard. And yet, storytelling-wise, it's always like, hey, what are we doing? Eh, let's go to the holodeck. As if it's like just sitting wide open uh, and not difficult to get. So, But one thing you've made clear to me is that anything that is manif is that you manifest on the holodeck needs to remain in the holodeck, right? It's not like you can like That's make right. a, a fruity cocktail. You can drink it, but you just can't leave the room with it. Well, the cocktail, interestingly, probably would be real because I believe they integrated the replicator systems right, into the holodeck. So, uh, so that you would be able to because it would be created differently than the characters and the rest of the holodeck because you're actually creating something real. You What you wouldn't be able to do is while you're drinking that fruity cocktail, you meet a lovely lady or gentleman by the pool in Rigelian 4 and you're like, hey, you want to come back to my cabin? No. So whatever um, you care to uh, partake in on the holodeck has to stay on the holodeck. So now, sorry, I apologize to any of our younger viewers. I'm going to keep this as PG as possible. Mm -hmm. If you were... What was the planet again we were just visiting? I, I, I think Rigelian 7. Okay, if we're on Rigelian, Rigelian 7, and mm -hmm. we meet a fun Rigelian that we want to spend mm -hmm. the evening with, perhaps mm -hmm. get Rigelly with it, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, or what, mm -hmm. was that, what was that mating dance that we did a couple of figures ago? Oh, you, you were thinking uh, the, the Horgon? Yes, the Horgon. Which, the, it's, it's not a dance, it's a figure, but whatever, close enough. Yeah, so yeah, if you like want... A, like a voodoo yeah. doll for like for bonin. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes, scientifically speaking. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's say that you were getting rye jelly with it uh, uh -huh, with uh -huh. your companion, which I imagine mm -hmm. would be relatively realistic in the confines of the holodeck. In the holodeck, it's it's perfect. And then like someone who had booked time, like you're going over time, and someone who had booked the next fifteen minutes walks in. Will they see the scene, or they'll just see you go into town? Oh no, they will see the whole. The oh, whole thing. Well, that's it's, better it's probably right than 
Yeah, well, they they did walk in on each other's holodeck activities an awful lot. Uh, I I feel like that that's one that could use a lock on the door. <laughs> and uh, there, there's a there's a pretty good joke on uh, on the lower decks about the uh, being the low man on the totem pole and having to clean the biofilters after uh, the holodeck. Mm. So uh, we will leave it right at that and go no further into that discussion. Well, where are we going, Keith? I'm going to tell you where we're going. We're going, we're going to skip the holodeck. We're going to go straight to 10 forward, which is also where you could get a fruity cocktail and uh, go to figure 6020, Guinan. Oh, you better believe it's Whoopi. Did you know Whoopi Goldberg was on Star Trek? You know I remember the giant red hat, yes. Yes, indeed. So 10 Forward, if you don't know, is the bar on the Enterprise D, which is, uh, it's a it's basically, you go there, you get cocktails, and they have endless uh, classical concerts in there as well. Uh, but Whoopi Goldberg, of course, uh, joined the cast in season two as a recurring character. She was showed up in the first episode of season two, The Child. She would do 28 episodes in total, uh, none in season seven, but was in uh, Generation, Star Trek Generations, the first TNG movie, and did a cameo in Nemesis. Now, Whoopi Goldberg, when she came on, uh, unlike the rest of the cast, was already a giant star. She was already an Oscar nominee for The Color Purple and uh, when she joined the cast, and she would win an Oscar for Ghost while she was on The Next Generation. So basically, they fit her into whatever episodes she was available for um, and then wrote a couple of specific episodes around her. But she was so such an amazing addition to the show. So what do you think here? I have thoughts. So, number one, you know, Keith and I have talked a lot about we're impressed when the detailing is really specific. Now, I like coloring, as we've we've heard, but so you would think that just a, a stark red costume, only red, would be disappointing to me. However, you want to talk about detailing. Look at the detailing in the costuming, her hair, the facial likeness, the plume of the pants— all the way to the texturing of the hat, specific to the model of the character. So the texturing of the hat is different than the texturing of the shoulders, which is different than the sheer texturing of the costume and the pants. All different, all specific, even to the gloves she's wearing. This is highly detailed. I absolutely love it, specifically that hat piece, which appears to be molded to the character, right? That's part of the mold? Oh, yeah. No, it's part of the mold, um, but... it is molded to the character in more the way more ways than uh, other like that that round headpiece which she didn't wear every episode but many episodes she had a variation on it became iconic it became that Guinan was represented by that giant headpiece and it, uh, and the texturing only Whoopi Goldberg could make that cool oh yeah absolutely and the texturing and we've we've mentioned this on other figures too that I really like about this line. Uh, Playmates specifically, if I remember, the Turtles are very, very much had this too, as well as He Man. I'm not sure if Playmates did He Man as well. I don't think they did. No, but it's not just the texturing itself, but actually the the sort of implied motion and flow of a lot of the uh, costuming. Like you can see, yeah. there's a flow, a billowing in that sort of what. So you can tell the sort of the 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 lightness of that sort of. Uh, Which is hard to do with hard plastic. Yeah, cape thing. And even in the hat in the front, those little swoops that you see in in the, the still shot are mimicked. It's a really great figure and not over-sexualized with the bright lipstick for no reason. <laughs> right. Well, but Guinan would never would never let you do that. She was, uh, first off, she was like 500 years old. Uh, the, the Her race lives for pretty much forever. Mm-hmm. She has like like some sort of powers that she was able to overpower Q oh. and uh and she was also the epitome of chill. She was like the coolest most chill character in history and uh had a great time travel episode. She went back to uh uh 1800 San Francisco. Great cool story where uh we have we have like a time loop. So anyway, I love this figure too. I love this character too. Um, that's what I like about this this uh, this episode is because these are all characters I love. 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, all right. Well, then let us well, hold go. On, Keith, bef- oh, let's, all right. Before we jump off of Whoopi, just to see if we can give total 100% credit, mm-hmm. I, is that the coloring of the screenshot, or she have like a cool pink sort of manicure going on in that screenshot? Can you tell? I believe she has a cool pink manicure. Uh, it did, that did not make it oh, onto the figure. That did not make it to the figure because okay. I think that's probably what Whoopi was just rocking that day. No, okay. When well, she was shooting it. So, so 99% accuracy. It's it's pretty good. It's yeah. pretty darn good. Well, here's uh, coming up on something that sometimes is good, sometimes is bad, but is always fun. This is 6058Q in the captain's uniform from The Next Generation. Oh. So this is probably the most iconic version of Q, uh, wearing... Uh, Captain Picard's uniform as a way to torment uh, Captain Picard, and because uh, he he's he's very sort of Loki ish. He's really just mm-hmm. doing a lot of things to try to annoy Patrick Stewart, which is always super fun, including wearing the uniform he hadn't earned. Uh, of course, played by John Delancey as always, and we saw this first uh, in the pilot. However, what we're seeing both on the screenshot and in the uh, on the figure, this is the season three plus uniform without the stripes on the shoulders and with uh, it being split at the waist. So this is the more uh, contemporary original next gen uniforms. Uh, John Delancey did eight episodes, including the pilot and the finale of uh, Next Generation. And spoiler alert, we'll be back for season two of Picard. Oh, cool. Very exciting uh, to see them come back. And of course, we saw Q on Deep Space Nine and Voyager as well. But because we are representing the next gen, that's what we're talking about. So, uh, yeah, talk to me. Uh, Interesting hand uh, molds. I think that's probably to hold his choking hazards, whatever he's got uh, with his collection of accoutrements. Uh, I I like it. It's very iconic. It's a very iconic Picard outfit that he's wearing, so I think that's cool to see the juxtaposition uh, with the pips and all. Uh, It's cool. I wish his hair... His hair doesn't exactly read to me, but I'm just being nitpicky because uh, that's kind of my gig. And uh, I dig it. it. It's interesting. On that screenshot, um, his hair looks a little longer and more unkempt than it usually does. Hmm. Where okay. I, I'm used to his hair being closer to what it is on the figure. All right, then I stand so, down. I shall stand down. I guess I guess John could have used a, a haircut before filming that episode. But you know, these things happen. Real life happens. Uh, and this is, of course, from season three, episode thirteen. Deja Q is what the uh, screenshot is from. He's about to uh, give Data his first ever laugh. Oh. If you're uh, if you're one of those folks who have seen the episode ten thousand times. There you are. So, uh, yeah, so this is just, you know, the standard Q figure. We have several more Qs to come um, in more ridiculous garb. But, uh, yeah, let us move forward to uh, one of these. Everybody loves all these characters, but this is one of the most beloved, beloved characters, recurring characters in all of Star Trek history. We are going to look at Figure 6045, Lieutenant Barkley. Oh, he Played, came in strong. of course, by Dwight Schultz, who you might know as a member of the A-Team, the original <laughs> A-Team. And uh, Lieutenant Barkley was on five episodes of Next Generation, plus he was on Voyager for several episodes and was in First Contact, the movie. He was first seen in the episode Hollow Pursuits, and this figure is from TNG Series 3, Wave 1. Now, one of the reasons that uh, this character is so beloved is this is one of the first characters we ever see on Star Trek who show some personal vulnerability. Mm. Barclay is not confident. He suffers from terrible anxiety. We meet him. He has a hollow addiction. Like one would imagine would be a real thing where he's 
basically becomes addicted to the holodeck because he doesn't have social anxiety in the holodeck. And then, of course, you know, creates all sorts of weird and inappropriate things on the holodeck. We're as weird and inappropriate as you can do on a PG rated show. Uh, but he gives this unbelievably endearing performance as this nervous, unconfident, but really bright guy. So basically who we would be on the Enterprise. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I exactly. And he's got a bit of a stutter, uh, which I had as a kid. And I don't know, like, it, it, it's really hard not to identify with him. And if you don't identify with him, I don't know what your life was. And, you know, congratulations. <laughs> but he was such a human character on the show and did all sorts of fun stuff uh, in the uh, screenshot there from uh, ep uh, season four, episode 19, the nth degree. He is actually performing from Cyrano. Uh, Troy was trying to get him to build his confidence by performing. And uh, from, and so he was doing a scene from uh, Cyrano de Bergerac. And he gets uh, sort of zapped with a super intelligent computer thing. And then all of a sudden he's, has, he's super confident. And so hmm. it's this really... And then of course it all goes wrong and he takes over the ship. You know, as like one does on uh, Star Trek. Uh, but it's a really, really fascinating character. And he... And we'll talk about the, his other figure later uh, when he appears as a very crucial part of the Star Trek Voyager history. So what do you think? You know, generally, I even just your explanation of the character, it makes me root for him. I'd love to see him on Toy Cam because I, I know your lighting's a little hotter here, but it also seems like they did a great job on his skin shading as he's clearly a more fair-skinned gentleman. And it seems yep. like they were able to capture that on the camera. So maybe we can pop over to Toy Cam. Toy Cam. Well, let's take a look at Barkley on the Toy Cam. There we go. Yeah, so he is definitely a little more fair skinned. Yep, he's definitely fair skinned, and he has he's got some receding hair. Yeah. You know, all sort of little things that make him much more relatable. Cool, and, I dig uh, him. Yeah, so it's a it's a really it's it's really cool, and you and you sort of it changes the perspective of your understanding of the cast and the show when you see all of our characters from a, a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So you have like all of these bridge people, but they're like superheroes to the, the people on the lower decks. And there's a great episode called the lower decks where uh, we see it from the perspective of the uh, lower ranking people who are just, you know, working their day job and like oh my god the crazy adventures they get up to they're so confident they're so cool and uh it it's like oh yeah so these people are extraordinary within their own world as well so uh yeah super cool uh if there's a barkley episode i'm definitely gonna watch it uh because dwight schultz is dynamite all right well let us Continue forward with another fan favorite, also a recurring character on Next Gen. This is figure 6044, Ensign Roe Laren. Let's beam her in. Lots to talk about with Ensign Roe. Uh, first off, she's the first Bajoran we see who become uh, a major uh, species on Deep Space Nine. But this is the first one we see, and this is from uh, TNG Series 3, Wave 2, played by the incredible actress Michelle Forbes. She was on eight episodes of Next Generation, first seen on the episode Ensign Row. Uh, she got her own episode title, and she came in as sort of a, uh, sort of a, a, a badass chip on her shoulder, doesn't really stick to protocol, but she's super, super uh, competent. And this is an interesting one for Michelle Forbes, the, ac the, the actor who plays Ensign Rowe. She was previously on Star Trek as a, as a sort of a, a day player guest actor uh, on the episode Half a Life. But she came in and she had to play like a, a sad scene with her father dying. And she was so good in it, they decided to write her a character on the show. Because hmm. they were like, who is this woman? She's so good. We need her to be on the show. 
And so they wrote this character for Michelle Forbes. Uh, and so she was really fun. Only did eight episodes because Michelle Forbes was going on to be sort of a movie star <laughs> at that point um, and has done a whole mess of other really cool things, including an incredible arc on the Battlestar Galactica series. Um, and she was doing Heat at this point. They uh, they actually offered her a series regular role on Deep Space Nine to play Ro as the Bajoran commander uh, but she turned it down because she didn't want to be tied down to a seven-year series, right. and thus they replaced the idea of Ensign Rowe with Kira, who we met in the Deep Space Nine figures, which is has a lot of similar elements to the character, including a pretty similar look. Uh, but yeah, he t- tell us your thoughts. Love it. Uh, looks like it's all leg. Is that just the angle there, or is that character just like mini torso, mostly leg? Uh yeah she's she's got got long legs they built for the uh for the character here and uh, you'll see these are the very simple female legs they use they don't turn so she can't turn in or out like we mentioned in some of the others it's a pretty simple standard figure uh it's very similar uh to some of the smaller ones from Voyager uh but a lot of the facial detail is is right and she's wearing a uh, a Bajoran earring. Oh yeah, I Which saw the is earring. Part of the culture there. Oops. And oh, she, she's coming back in. Uh, which was a plot point in this episode because Riker made her take it off to uh, meet Next Gen's uniform code oh. before eventually realizing that that was uh, you know kind of inappropriate because it's part of her religious identity, and uh, she got to keep it later. So oh, that's uh, you know what that's kind of a interesting. Uh, re- realization for Riker to have that's that's pretty progressive TNG congratulations well the Star Trek is specifically progressive that's the whole idea you don't have to lambast me Keith that's pretty very regressive <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna progress forward to the next <laughs> yeah. next figure <laughs> so this is another interesting uh I was gonna say interesting character but this actress is part of Star Trek history. She is a cornerstone of car- Star Trek history, and she is portrayed here in figure 6967, Lwaxana Troy. Oh, yeah, everything. Everything. Tell me it. You've seen Troy. You've seen Deanna Troy, but have you ever wondered what would her mother be like? Well, here you are. This is Majel, Majel Barrett playing Troy's mother. Now, she is an institution in Star Trek. She did seven episodes on The Next Generation as this character and three episodes of Deep Space Nine on as this character. She is also the voice of the Federation computer oh. doing hundreds of episodes. Anytime they talk to the computer, who talks back? It's Majel Barrett. You think that's, well, that's a lot. That's a lot of Star Trek, right? There's more. She played Nurse Chapel on the original series. She also played several characters on the Star Trek animated series in the 70s. She also was in the unaired pilot of the original series, and she played number one, the first officer. Hmm. She was the one that the network in 1964 was like, a woman in command? That's impossible. And so she got uh, maddeningly demoted as a different character uh, to be a nurse. Huh. Which sucks. But the character of number one is back in uh, on Star Trek Discovery, which is a prequel. So she's uh, the, the character is back in contemporary times. So could she possibly have another Star Trek connection? Well, she sure could because she was married to Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek. Oh, and still got demoted by the network, huh? He, I guess he couldn't go to mm-hmm. bat. He wanted the show to get produced. It, yes. Well, he was a, speaking of progressive, he was a very progressive guy, except for when it came to the ladies. Uh, <laughs> that's a thing to talk about on a different subject. Um, but after, she, before she died, 
she recorded her voice phonetically so they can continue using her as the voice of the computer. Wow. She's like the Siri of Star Trek. She is the Siri of Star Trek. That's exactly what she is. And uh, yeah, so, and this this character was a sort of wild, over-the-top um, character that was always embarrassing Troy and hitting on Picard and then later hitting on Odo uh, and was, uh, it, it, she, she was occasionally annoying and occasionally great. <laughs> uh, depending on which episode she was in, the character was. But uh, Majel Barrett's acting is extraordinary. There's an episode um, of Next Gen where she has to break down over the you know the the death of a daughter that she had in the past, and it is the episode itself isn't great, but that scene it's oh my god what she's capable of doing. Uh so uh, talk, talk about the figure here. I think. You know, it seems that the, the the costuming department on Star Trek, when they're given the opportunity to kind of let the reins off, down, really, like, this costume is just incredible. From the silhouette to the, to the really sort of bold and interesting cutout, the, uh, the detailing, and then it translates over to the figure. I really think the figure is great. We see the cutout, the... the the likeness is is pretty good. I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's it's facially it's, it's pretty good. It's I think. facially pretty good, and, and her makeup on the show even is pretty kind of. It seems to fit the character you've described as a little, a little much maybe, but on purpose. A lot much yeah. on purpose, yeah. Uh, but what I really want to highlight here is I think the painting on the skirt there, like they're not giving you a brown skirt. They're giving that that bejeweled detailing on the bustle there. Or on the front there, and then that that sort of smatter painting is really gorgeous. And Keith, yeah. I'll give you a shout out here with your sort of projector lighting there really accentuates it specifically right there, so we can see some of the coloring. Really, just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous figure. Do you have it on toy cam? I can do that, and I can do you one better because I have it in the box. Oh we yeah, we can take a look at the choking hazards. Here we go. So there's the figure. Here is the figure in the box. Uh, you can see that it came with a, a card. They uh, after series one of Next Gen, they started putting them in with uh, with collectible cards, which are really fun. And so you see in her choking hazards, there's a, a bu whole bunch of jokes that she has too many, too much luggage, and uh, people are always getting drunk. Now here. Now, you want to get really crazy. So I mentioned uh, when we were looking at the Quark figure that the actor who plays Quark, Armin Zimmerman, played uh, several other characters, including a box. And basically, it's a face on a box that oh, opens that up what and that is spits down there? out jewels. There is the box with the face on it from the first <laughs> time we see. That's pretty stellar. Loaxana Troy. So, uh, lots of cool stuff. This is the this is the box from uh, obviously the seventh season, uh, and you can see what else came out that year. And it's they called a talking gift box. They forgot to mention that it was played by the guy who plays Quark. So, uh, really interesting, very detailed figure. I forgot to mention that I also have the uh, Ensign Row in the box. Oh, let's look at that. So here is Ensign Row's figure in the box. It's from the same series uh, from that uh, from let's, that era. She's let's take a look at the back because I don't think I switched the camera over when you showed it last time. Oh yeah. So here is where they come with a Skybox collector card. These are all the ones from uh, what was it? Uh, series three. Uh, series three, wave two. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, not a lot to it. I don't know why they gave her a duffel bag. It looks like a purse. Ensign Rowe would not have a purse. <laughs> <laughs> Full stop. Uh, but uh, you can also see they're advertising the Deep Space Nine figures on this on the back of this box, which mm. we uh, talked about. So they came out at about the uh, at about the same time. All right. Well, are you ready for our finale? Oh, I can't wait. The finale of this series. Um, this is a 
a recurring character who was not on very many episodes, but had a lasting legacy on Star Trek. That is 6037 Hugh. Yeah. Here is Hugh, who obviously, do you, do you know what species that is, Mike? Uh, obviously, it's he's uh, uh, he's Borg, right? He's Borg. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well done. And uh, he was first seen in season five, episode twenty-three, "I Borg," which is an amazing episode, um, in which they discover a crash crash landed uh, Borg ship. And there's only one survivor, and it's this one single Borg who is disconnected from the rest of the Borg and is sort of distressed trying to figure out what's going on. And as they uh, debate what to do about him, because Picard at this point is like, we should just kill him, because he's if he's going to connect to the Borg and come back and we're all going to die, they discover that he begins having his own individual identity. And makes friends with folks, and they have to figure out what to do. How, you know, what is the ethical thing to do here? Um, and of course, it's played by Jonathan Del Arco, who did such a good job on this episode because he has to play the scary, menacing Borg, but also with a this vulnerability and innocence to him um, as he befriends Jordy. So it's really, it's really, really very, very cool. So cool, in fact that they brought him back for Picard. All those years later, we were able to check in on him and how he is doing. Uh, really, really fun. Jonathan Del Arco uh, would also play the character of Fantome on uh, the Voyager episode, The Void. So, uh, yeah, talk to me. Now, Borg assimilants aren't always jacked up like this dude, right? Uh, No. No, they they're all basically the same shape. I don't know why they gave him such a such a six pack, but you know, look, Jonathan Del Arco keeps it tight. Let's be honest. <laughs> uh the design is freaking awesome. It's got like a, a, a it's very sci-fi, but it's also very mechanical and industrial, which I think is awesome. Uh, the eyepiece thing is super cool. It's very it's very uh, re, it's very indicative of the character design in the show just pretty awesome the boots are super rad uh it's given me like um bane vibes a little bit mm -hmm. uh, very cool I'm, I'm i'm digging this character now one of the things if we uh if we hop over to toy cam there's there's something i want to point out here with the modeling of this figure specifically his face because on the other borg uh, figures, they have a very scary, sort of mm -hmm. almost skeletor face. And what you see here is it's a much more vulnerable looking face. And it, that's very much part of the storytelling is that we, we discover this is a vulnerable, kind person who had just been abducted, essentially. And, and so it is a much less scary looking figure. It's also a little bit smaller than the standard Borg figures. So it's basically one of those, just like on the episode, you see it from far away and it's terrifying. And the closer you get in, you realize, oh, that's, a, that's like a person and, and is not nearly as scary as you would expect. So it's all sort of good storytelling in the casting and the makeup. And it's reflected here in the figure, which I'm a... Which I'm a big fan of. Yeah, honestly. really cool, really cool. I love when they take subtle uh, things like that. You know, you, there's clearly a team of people making these models, and I'm sure there are discussions, or at least in our universe, would like to believe there are discussions that how can we, how can we do some of that storytelling in the in the modeling of the figure as well. Right, 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 and uh, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I was uh, watching a uh, a benefit. Um, a political benefit with the cast of Star Trek. And I believe uh, it was Andrew Yang had a copy of this toy <laughs> because because they were, they were interviewing Jonathan. And 
asked him to sign it. So he actually had this specific toy. Oh, that's cool. Uh, is it, it's either Andrew Yang or Stacey Abrams. I, I forget which one. But anyway, they're both big Star Trek nerds. So uh, very, very cool. Well, look, we got through the uh, TNG recurring Friends and Enemies Part 1. Uh, what do you think, Mike? Sum Loved it all it. up for us. Loved it. I uh, sometimes think that some of the recurring characters maybe have, because they have less of a, a narrative length to their arc, uh, more storytelling gets to take place. And uh, I'm interested to explore these characters. I loved seeing the figures. And I'm really excited for part two because I have to say the alien episode we've, we we checked out as well as this episode, Keith, have been some of my faves. Yeah, good fun. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. Well, we will see you next week. Uh, but before you go, do us a huge favor. Uh, like and subscribe. Uh, you know, the, Hit the bell. Uh, mm -hmm. So you get the notification when we put out a new episode. Uh, this has been really fun. You can find us on Instagram at Star Trek Toys. You can email us at look at my Star Trek Toys at gmail.com. Leave us a comment below. We'll chat with you. We're checking it. We're going to read it. We're going to talk to you because it's super fun. And we love all the questions. We love all the comments. We love hearing about your collections and who you have and who you don't have. And uh, we can all work together to complete our collections. It's uh, it's pretty exciting. I'm, I've really been enjoying doing this. So uh, we, we'll, we'll drop in an unboxing or two here and there along the feed. But otherwise, we will see you next week on... Look at my Star Trek toys!